Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. You're listening to Great Women in Compliance on the Compliance Podcast Network. I'm Mary Shirley, and today we have Marianne Ibrahim here with us. Marianne, please tell us a little bit about your background. Hi, Mary. Thank you so much for having me. So I am the Director of Global Compliance for Baker Hughes, a GE company, and we operate in 120 countries. I'm very proud to work for a company that truly believes in my subject matter, integrity and ethics. Wonderful. What is it about compliance that makes it a career of choice for you? That's a good question. So before I went in-house, I was a commercial litigator, and I would sum up what I did as corporate divorce. It was intellectually challenging and stimulating, but the purpose just was not. And so I was fortunate to transition into compliance, and there's so much purpose that aligns with my personal values more so in this field. And, you know, building this career where one can help drive a culture of ethics and integrity is, it's simply a dream, Mary, as you know, you're in this profession as well. And at its core, I think, I believe compliance affects human rights. And what better purpose to work for such a career that truly has an impact on human rights, right? And when senior leaders of major corporations like mine, you know, truly believe in it, it affects the communities we operate in. And it even gives more value and purpose for what I do. So this is, compliance is just truly a perfect and easy fit for me. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the fact that we are sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly helping the most disenfranchised members of society and what we do is our core jobs. I couldn't be more proud of that. Yes, indeed. It has been said that one of the reasons that women are underrepresented in leadership is that we lack executive presence. You're a strong figure who has executive presence in spades. What advice would you give to a woman who wants to improve on being seen to have gravitas and command a room? Ah, so my advice would be to communicate with purpose. Believe in what you do and believe in what you're saying. Look your senior management in the eye and project your voice. And frankly, Mary, this applies to men and women. When men and women present, sometimes I see that they hesitate or they don't believe in what they're saying almost. Their posture is slumped. Their body language is not convincing. You know, if you have a message, own it. Prepare before you speak. Research it. Look someone in the eye. Don't hesitate. Project your voice. And I think a lot of that is really on how someone comes across um, in a meeting, in a day-to-day conversation. And it's something, thankfully, it comes naturally to me, but in others, I have to encourage them and remind them, especially the younger generation who may not even be aware of that. And a lot of them will tell me that's the first time anyone's told me that, right? And so it's really to own your own being and voice and project yourself. What are some of the little giveaways that show a lack of confidence that you're seeing in those around you that you're hoping to mentor? What are some of the things that people may not be conscious of themselves that you're picking up on? Sure. It's the posture I think is huge. Slouching and having that slumped look about oneself isn't polished, right? And it shows that it's almost as, and women unfortunately do this more than men, they try to make themselves smaller. Own your space, own your room, put your hands on either side of your chair and, you know, own your space. That's one tip I would give. And the other tip is make eye contact. I don't know why when sometimes people are speaking with others or presenting the senior leadership, they're almost avoiding that eye contact. You know, make your message purposeful. And if you're going to do that, you've got to make eye contact. I think that's right. And I think for another downside for the more junior staff is that they're the ones who are more likely to be the ones taking notes in the meeting. They're the dedicated staff member who have to do that. And that's losing opportunities to connect with others in the room. 
So if you are the one that's been delegated that task, think about the efficiency of taking your notes and ensuring that even if you do have a piece of paper and a pen in front of you, that where you can take the opportunity to be looking up, if you have an opportunity to speak and something valuable to say, make sure you're saying it on top of your note taking. Right. Or do what I do and learn a type without looking at your keyboard. And so, yep, yep, absolutely. <laughs> Double points if you can type on your keyboard and have a conversation with someone else and continue your email at the exact same time. (laughs) Multitask. Exactly. Marianne, your travels have taken you to over 80 countries. That's amazing. When navigating different cultures on business travel, have you had any difficult moments as a woman? So one of the things I do, and I would advise this for anyone traveling to a country for the first time, is read about the culture read about not just the business etiquette, but the etiquette of, you know, the different genders and expectations and the culture. So I definitely have done that before I, every country I travel to. And as you said, it's over 80 countries now. I'm starting to repeat travel to a lot of these countries. But I think that's just essential to know the culture, know the etiquette. And I, you know, one of the things is, Thankfully, I have not had disparate treatment in, in my gender in traveling to even very conservative countries. So I'm very thankful for that. And I think it's because when you show up and you mean business and you own your space, that you're taken seriously, regardless of your gender, right? And you know your subject matter and you're confident. So thankfully, I've not experienced that. But I do have one story where was a bit awkward. And basically I was wearing, I was in a Middle Eastern country, very conservative Gulf country. And I had a button down shirt and I was introducing myself to the chairman of this third party we were working with. And he refused to shake my hand. And he said, I will not shake your hand until you button your button. So I was a bit mortified, quickly recovered. My button was unbuttoned in the most inconvenient place. I quickly buttoned it, extended my hand again, and we continued on. So other than that glitch, I have not had, thankfully, any other problems. That's wonderful. And I remember when I was working out in the Middle East, I was made aware of the fact that some gentlemen are not of the practice of shaking hands with women who aren't family members. So one of the things that I was always conscious of was that it may not be appropriate for my hand to be shaken. And so I would not extend my hand unless the counterparty or the colleague or whoever the third party in the room was, was extending theirs to me first. And I do remember a time in Kuwait where male colleagues, hey, they had their hand shaken and I didn't. And On the one hand, I know that if it was a customary part of the culture, that's understandable and nothing personal against me. Did I feel left out? Yeah, I did a little bit. But like you, overall, my experiences have been largely extremely positive. And at the time that I was spending a lot of time in the Middle East and based out there, I worked for a very male-dominated company. And I'm guessing you see that in Baker Hughes as well, because I worked in a parallel company, but correct me if I'm wrong. And I have, you know, I look back with very fond memories on how I was treated in that company. And colleagues who were almost always men they looked after me almost to the point of mothering. There was one time I was very unwell at a conference and I came in and I said, she'll sweet my lad. I'm sick that morning. And there was a collective, oh, from my colleagues. And they took turns checking in on me, sending me medicine up to my room, texting to make sure I was feeling well enough to come out to dinner and so on. And so whilst this doesn't invalidate any of opposing experiences that anyone may have had, I personally have been very lucky to have incredibly supportive and respectful male colleagues. That's incredible, Mary. And I share that same sentiment. Thankfully, I've worked for a company, Baker Hughes, a GE company that truly believes in diversity and inclusion. And I've never felt, again, any disparate treatment because of my gender. It's a meritocracy and and as it should be, right? So thankfully, you and I have had very positive experiences. Absolutely. 
Before I moved out to the Middle East, I'd never traveled to the region before. And I remember 29-year-old me panicking as to what would be appropriate dress. I thought, gosh, am I going to have to overhaul my wardrobe? What, what is expected of me in the corporate environment in Dubai and the neighboring countries when I travel there for business? Marianne, what is your advice for professional dress for women who are traveling to the Middle East for the first time and wanting to ensure that they are sensitive to local culture? Sure. Well, my first piece of advice would be do not pack a button-down shirt. I have since uh, (laughs) not packed a button-down shirt since that experience. So just avoid them. Not worth it. And basically what I packed is a pantsuit and just very conservative dress. But I believe in conservative dress for the most part in in every aspect of my work and for the Middle East even more so in, in some other cultures. So be true to your own personal style. You know, you don't have to dress like a man, but be conservative. I think that's right. Looking professional is fairly consistent across borders. If you're feeling like you're looking professional in one place, generally you're going to be okay for another. And if you're worried about the heat in Dubai and whether you're good or other hot climates, remember that there's going to be air conditioning as well. So wearing or having at least a jacket or a blazer with you is going to make you feel comfortable, not only for whether you're concerned about being conservative enough, but also when it comes to dealing with the temperatures. That's right. And you raised another good point and it's stress the part. I, I definitely believe in that mantra. Agreed, totally. What efforts do you go to in order to inspire and advance the growth of the next generation of female compliance officers? Ah, I love this question. So I very much invest in our younger talent. And my advice to other senior compliance officers would be to reach out to them because they will not automatically come to you for advice. So I go out of my way. I reach out to them. I take them out to lunch and ask them how they're doing and how they're feeling and where they want to go. And a lot of times they don't know or they need that advice or direction. They have so many questions. And so just be present, reach out to them. I really enjoy those conversations. It reminds me of me when I was young. I had so many questions and I myself didn't reach out. Thankfully, I had some good mentors in my life, but in my career, but I would definitely take the first step and take the initiative and then constantly keep up. It's not a one-time thing, right? It's not a limited opportunity. It's an ongoing opportunity. And I check in regularly with those that I mentor inside my company and outside. And it's very rewarding. And it definitely, I feel like I'm investing in the future. I think that's great advice. And it can be very tempting to think and pat yourself on the back after saying, I totally have an open door, everyone. I'm very approachable. And yet it can be quite scary for someone else who's new to the workplace to stand at the threshold of a boss's office or a more senior person's office and, you know, feel like they're not wasting people's time going in there. So the fact that you're proactively going out and making sure that it's a two-way street that builds that true feeling of approachability in your staff, I love that. Thank you. One of the sentiments that Cheryl Sandberg is known for is that every time a young girl is called bossy, she wants her to be told that she has leadership skills. Marianne, we often face the unfair stereotype of being bossy rather than it being classed as assertive. What do you think are some of the ways that we can combat this? First of all, I love this comment and I actually have taken it to heart personally and always call my niece a future executive when I feel (laughs) like she may have the bossy persona. So I think it is very important in how we phrase and describe behaviors in either gender. But personally and professionally, what I do is basically I am very approachable in everything I do. And my team knows I truly do have an open door and I'm seen as one of them. 
they are my team, but we're all on the same level. I'm not above them. I'm not better than them. A lot of them are smarter than me. I learn so much from my team. And, you know, we're all in this together and it's our collective goal of achievement and collective goal of improving our culture and the compliance environment and controls and having that continual improvement mindset. And we're just on that similar plane. And I just have this incredible team. And I really think it's just having that team mentality and team spirit that really counts. That's really lovely. What do you wish you had known earlier in your career about being an effective investigator? An effective investigator, I would say be yourself, be genuine, have your own style. You know, there's so many different styles I've seen over the years, witnessing others conducting investigations and myself when I was younger. Sometimes investigators, especially those that have formerly worked with the government, believe that, you know, having this aggressive style is the best style and just being aggressive and assertive. And and frankly, that just doesn't work, especially with other cultures outside of the U.S. And so it's be genuine. But if your genuine self is assertive or aggressive, take your time get to know the individual, ask how they're doing. And you'll watch their shoulders, you know, sort of slump a little and their demeanor be a little more comfortable with you. And that's when they truly open up and then follow that up with very open-ended questions. There's open-ended questions and then there's more open-ended questions, right? And so really start big picture and then you know, dwindle that down and then you can funnel it down to exactly what you're trying to obtain and the facts you're trying to get to. But yeah, so I would just sum it up as be yourself, have your own personal style, but be very self-aware if you do have an assertive tendency and make sure you're making the interviewee very comfortable. Oh, Marianne, you just really speak to me. I think my learning curve was the same. I started out working for an antitrust regulator. So for me, the way I learned how to interview and what I saw from my senior colleagues when I first witnessed someone conducting an interview was actually very different to how I believe investigations should be conducted in-house in the workplace today. And so the key that I would reiterate would be do not view investigations as interrogations. This is not a, you can't handle the truth (laughs) moment with um, your colleagues, right? Because a lot of the time you're investigating something that will not end up being substantiated. And that makes things really quite awkward going forward. So focus on it being a fact-finding mission rather than an interrogation. That's what I learned is my biggest lesson in investigations. Certainly. Amy Cuddy's TED Talk on body language is the second most viewed TED Talk of all time. In addition to checking it out for more tips that will help with your confidence and executive presence, think about asking for feedback on your executive presence from trusted colleagues or former co-workers. We often expect feedback on substantive matters and even EQ, But to build your self-awareness more holistically, it can be helpful to get some feedback as to whether you're presenting yourself how you wish to be perceived. That was Great Woman in Compliance with Mary Shirley and Marianne Ibrahim on the Compliance Podcast Network. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review. 